Well, good morning. If you weren't sleepy, then that might have made you sleepy. <laughs> uh, good morning. My name is Tiffany. Uh, my husband, Elliot, and I have the great honor of being able to pastor this group of people called Lifeline Church. Uh, we love you guys. Good morning to everyone who's watching online as well. We love you, too. Maybe we haven't met you yet. That's okay. Um, so tomorrow is April Fool's Day. Did you guys know that? April 1st, April Fool's Day. Uh, I was remembering this morning. Anybody have April April Fool's planned? You got you got a prank you're going to pull? You got one? Okay, let me give you one that you shouldn't do. Are you ready? Are you ready? I've got one. Uh, when I was a kid, let me tell you a story. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to live at my grandma's house. Way too many people lived at my grandma's house. You ever lived in a place where there's too many people there? <laughs> Like, that's just, that's normal life, right? When you got your mom and your dad and your brother and your sister and your grandma and your cousin and it's a two-bedroom apartment. <laughs> too many people. Too many people. At least we're on the bottom floor. We weren't on the, because we could have been, second story. Then our neighbors would have been, anyway. Uh, okay, so we lived there. I was a kid, grade school. So fourth to sixth grade is when we lived there. <clears throat> Me and my brother had a great idea on April Fool's Day. We were like, man, it's April Fool's. Let's pull a joke. Uh, we had a cousin who was like 10 years older than us, Jesse. He lived with us. Uh, we live with my grandma. We all live with my grandma, actually. And we decided that it would be an awesome prank to take uh, garlic powder and put it all over his carton of cigarettes, like cover every cigarette in garlic powder. Because <laughs> we were like, that can't be bad. It's funny. He won't even know that it happened. He knew. He knew. And he wasn't really a nice guy, so it was a bad joke. <gasps> so if you have an April Fool's planned, well, go for it. You can try that. You'll probably get killed. Um, at least it was my cousin. Okay. Ah, anyway, I love my family. They're great and crazy. And I know you all have great, crazy families, too. Fit right in. Uh, so we're in a series this, uh, this time around. This is week part two of a series. Uh, how to live through a bad day. How to live through a bad day. And this series was inspired by uh, Pastor Chris Hodges out of Church of the Highlands in Alabama. We watch their stuff sometimes because they do good things really cool things. And so th he took this series, created this series, and it was actually based off of a book uh, from Pastor Jack Hayford, Dr. Jack Hayford, doesn't matter, his name is Jack Hayford, he's a pastor and a doctor. Um, and he wrote the book, and the book was about, it was how to live through a bad day. And what he does is he looks at the seven statements that Jesus makes while he's on the cross. Now, you know, when Jesus is on the cross, we call that Good Friday. That was a good Friday. But for Jesus, it was his worst Friday. Like, we, t we said that last week. Our good Friday is his worst Friday. So what we're doing is we're looking at the seven statements that Jesus made on the absolute worst day of his life. And we're looking about, okay, if Jesus made it through this bad day, how did he do it? And then how can we do it too? And so our theme scripture comes from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. I'm going to read it out of the message version because it sounds cool. And it says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Because we're all in the same race. You guys know we're in the same race that Jesus was in. Praise God, there's hope. Study how he did it. Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. That exhilarating finish in and with God. That was the finish line, and that's where he's headed. If we're in the same race, we're going to the same place, and we can study how he did it. He could put up with anything along the way, the cross, the shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. Amen. Amen. And that is where we're headed. So what we're going to do is we're going to study how we did it. We're going to look at Jesus' worst day and we're going to pull out the second principle of how to live through a bad day. Uh, last week was the first week, and Pastor Elliot brought that message. It was really funny and really good. So if you missed it, you should go uh, watch. You can watch it on Facebook, or you can pull it up online. And the first thing we learned was how to live through a bad day was to forgive everyone who's trying to ruin your life. Anybody got people who are trying to ruin your life? Like, you're the person who cut you off on the way to church this morning. <laughs> you can forgive them. Go ahead. Uh, so that was the first one. If you missed it, go back and watch it. <clears throat> Lesson number two is what we're going to look at today. So if you've ever seen a depiction of Jesus on the cross, then what you'll normally see is you'll see it's, be it's a beautiful picture where you got the rolling hills. There's like three rolling hills. And then on that central hill, there's three crosses. And Jesus is on the center cross. And then on the cross, there's two people on either side of him. 
And this is because Jesus' worst day happened to coincide with two other people who were having a really bad day. There was, there was two criminals on either side of Jesus who were being crucified that day. And so Jesus, this is what I want you to notice, Jesus on his worst day was not alone in his struggle. He was surrounded by two fellow strugglers. And that's what we're going to look at today. Luke 23, if you guys have, when you walked in the door, you should have gotten a bulletin. In that bulletin is a sermon note insert, and there are fill in the blanks. So you need to pull those out right now. There's a pen in front of you, and be ready to fill in those blanks. Uh, we're going to look at the scripture. You can also do that on version, the Bible app, and we do have them up on the screens as well. Okay, so Luke 23, it's going to show us the second statement that Jesus makes during the worst Friday when he's hung up on the cross, and it says this out of verses 39 through 43. It says, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. So when we're looking at that, that scene, the first guy was hurling insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? And so Pastor Jack Hayford, when, uh, in the book, he recognizes the fact that these two men who are getting what they deserve, they had heard about Jesus. Because <laughs> the one guy is insulting him. If you're the Christ, why don't you get yourself down off that cross and get me off it as well? If you're the Christ, why are you letting him put you on a cross? So he's hurling insults at him. Uh, and the other guy, uh, so, he, so this guy clearly heard the rumors about Jesus and decided that they weren't true. And he was reacting based off that. And the other guy heard the rumors about Jesus and was maybe a little uncertain, but he certainly wasn't going to insult the Son of God if he was the Son of God. And so he says, remember me. And so in the middle of that guy's struggle, this is interesting, in the middle of that guy's struggle, what he most wanted was to be seen. What he most wanted was someone to see him and hopefully find comfort. You ever been in the middle of a struggle when you've got some real needs, but the biggest need is, doesn't anybody see me? Can't anybody help me? And so he says, remember me. And the second statement that Jesus says to that man is, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. So I, I just want you to get the picture here for just a second. Uh, in the middle of what Jesus is going through, so he's hung on the cross, uh, and scripture says that he's naked in nicer terms <laughs> because it says that they cast lots for his garments and then they said that his undergarment, they were going to tear it to pieces, but to fulfill the scripture, they cast lots for it instead. So Jesus is stark naked, hanging up on a cross for the world to see. Yikes. Okay. And then not only that, he has been beaten beyond recognition so that his own mother couldn't even recognize him. If, if, if his mom were to look at him, she'd say, that's not my son. Okay, severely beaten. And then imagine if he's been severely beaten, they didn't clean him up. So he's got dried blood just running down his body from all the wounds. And now he's hanging up on the cross. When you're hanging up on the cross, they say that they, they put the nail right in between the nerves. So when your body sinks down and you begin to sink down, your whole body feels, your, the nerves are shooting all of that information to your brain. It's an overwhelming sensation of pain. And this is the state that Jesus is in. And someone on the other side of him says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And when you look at Jesus on the cross, there's no way that Jesus is in any position to help anybody. Yet somehow he summons the strength. He lifts up his head. He looks over and he says he sees the man. In the middle of Jesus' worst Friday, in the middle of the most excruciating pain that he would ever experience, in his complete brokenness, in his complete vulnerability, he looks up and he sees a fellow struggler and he says, today you'll be with me. In the middle of his struggle, Jesus looked up and over and offered hope. And so the second principle of how to get through a bad day, be ready to fill in the blank, is help others. Help others who are experiencing your same struggle. So the first one was funny. Forgive everyone who's trying to ruin your life. And the second one is a little bit more serious. Help others. 
who are experiencing your same struggle. That means basically he's telling us, get your eyes off yourself. In the middle of your worst pain, you still have what it takes to help someone else. Because if we're looking at Jesus, keep your eyes on Jesus. Study how he did it. In the middle of the most excruciating pain, he was still focused on bringing other people into the kingdom. Amen? Okay, so instead of focusing only on ourselves when we're having a bad day, we can look around and we can see someone else. And when we look around and see someone else, it will help us. The bene- it will benefit you. That's the, that Jesus wants to teach us something. So there's more fill in the blanks. When we help others who are experiencing our same struggle, it will distract us from our own needs. When you look up and over and you see someone in a struggle in the middle of your struggle, it will distract you from your own needs. Okay. Let's think about it. Anybody ever had a really bad day, and when you focus only on yourself, it's like the whole world is crashing in on you? Like, I got no solutions to this problem. I have no resources. I have zero ability to fix this. And then the world begins to feel so small, and you begin to feel trapped, and you begin to feel heavy, and like every person is against you because this one thing has got you so bound up. Okay, so it's a funny story. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you see that when you look up and you help others, it'll distract you from your own need. When I was in high school, I had the, hideous, the most hideous car you ever did see. It was a Ford Escort, two-door Ford Escort maroon. And it had, like, that bubbled um, tinting on it. And it was a stick shift, which I killed at stoplights all the time. It was the worst. Okay. But one day, I was, I was driving to school. It was a rainy day. And every day when I went to school, we lived on a busy street. And so... And we had like, it was like four houses, yada, yada. I had to park on the street instead of in the driveway. And so when I, when I was going to school, I made a U-turn. Okay, so I would U-turn across this lane and then across the turn lane and then into the lane I was supposed to be in. And I did it every morning. And this morning it's raining and I'm running late. So I get in the car and I look to see if anybody's coming, and I decide no one's coming, and so I make the turn. <laughs> I was wrong. Somebody was coming, and so I got smashed. Uh, and the lady who smashed me had a pacemaker, and so then I felt horrible because I'm like, is this lady going to die? Woo! I, don't, I didn't know anything about pacemakers. Anyway, so my car smashed, and what happened is when I got smashed, she hit my, it was my fault, but she, she hit me. Um, she hit my driver's side back tire. So, you know, your tires are supposed to be straight. My back one was like this. So I couldn't drive it. So then I missed, you know, because if you get in an accident, you have to wave the bleeds, and then they file a blue report, and then they're going to move your car, and it's a process. So I was late to school. I didn't show up until, like, lunchtime, and I'm having a pretty bad day. Anybody? Anybody had a bad day where something unexpected comes up, and you're like, that's it. Ruined. My day's ruined, okay? So I go to school. Um, so I had a bad day. Then the next day, it's like the middle of the week. So I'm, I, I work a full-time job while I'm going to school. So I know I just have to park my car on the side of the road and wait till the weekend. On the weekend, I'll get the thing towed or the tire fixed or whatever. I'm not even thinking about it right now. I just got to get through work and school. So the next day, I wake up, and I'm getting a ride to school because I can't drive my car. And when I walk out of my house, my car is up on blocks. Someone had jacked up my car and taken all my tires. I was like, you're kidding me, right? <laughs> I had, when I bought the car, I bought it from the, some used car lot, and it had these, like, 17-inch white racing rims. Okay, so they wanted the rims, and they was like, oh, d- yeah, we'll just, she already had a bad day. We'll make it worse, and we'll take all our tires. So now I'm, like, I'm pretty mad because I had a bad day yesterday when I crashed my car, and now some guy decides, oh, yeah, these tires, they're mine. I'll just take them. They're not yours. People stealing my stuff. Nothing makes me more mad. Ah! Anyway, so I was pretty mad that day. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world do you get a broken car to a, to a place to, to get new tires when you don't have any tires to tow the thing? So I'm like overwhelmed with my problem, thinking there's, there's no way to fix this. There is no way to fix my car because they took my tires. But what happened is I had to go to school. I had responsibility, and I had to go to work. So I ended up leaving my car there, and I went to school, and I went to work. And what happened is when I was at school and I was at work and I was around other people who had more immediate needs, like they failed the test, and you're in high school, so that matters, you know? And so you can provide, oh, no, that's okay. You'll do, you'll do better next time. Or they forgot to turn in their homework. Or something bad happened at home, and I was able to connect with all my friends and the people during the day and provide some hope and encouragement. When I came home later 
in the day, I realized that the immediacy of my needs that morning were not as great as I thought they were going to be. There was a way to get my car towed. There was a way to get it fixed. When we help others, it distracts us from our own needs. Amen? Because sometimes you just need to be distracted. If you keep focusing on your struggle, thinking you're the only one having a bad day, you're never going to get out of your bad day. We, we, need, to, we need to keep our eyes up and over. So it, um, <clears throat> the other thing is that it helps us to see the solution. When we help others in the middle of our struggle, it will help us to see the solution to our problem. Um, when we are going through something, we're often so blinded to the next right step or what we can do about it. Uh, but when you see someone else in your same struggle, <laughs> it's funny because you often make the best counselor. Like you, if you're married, you ever been in a situation where you just, uh, you don't, you know, husband and wife aren't getting along so well, like you're irritated or you're frustrated or, you know, you got some negative things to say and you look over at your friends, you know, they're, they're a couple, married, married couple, and they're also in the middle of a struggle. They're not really liking each other. They got their issues and you look over at them. They're talking to you about their struggle and you think to yourself, well, I know what your problem is. You're just not nice. All you got to do is be nice. I mean, if you're a little bit nicer, then you wouldn't have this issue. And so in the middle of you being the best counselor in the world, Jesus helps you to see the solution to your own problem. And he says, take your own advice. <laughs> so when we look up and over, and he helps us to counsel someone else, he's also counseling us in the middle of that. It helps us to see the solution. It helps us to implement what we are seeing and what we are saying. And the other thing that it does is it allows us to put everything in perspective. When we're looking around at other people in the middle of our struggle, it helps us put everything in perspective. And I'm not talking about comparison, make, you know, make playing the comparison game, well, I'm doing better than them because of this or this. I mean perspective. I'm going to tell you a story. Um, when we were first married, we lived in an apartment. It was like a 500-square-foot apartment. And then we bought a house. We bought the cheapest house in all of Lodi. There was only one house in our price range. That was it. If you want to buy a house, this is, <laughs> this is your house. Congratulations. And so we bought it. We bought the cheapest house in all of Lodi. And we also, uh, along with the cheapest house in all of Lodi, got the longest escrow they ever did make. I, th I can't remember. It was a while ago. But I think it was like a 60 or a 90-day escrow. Okay, that's a long time because normally they're 30 days. Sometimes I think you can even get 15, okay? So escrow, a super long escrow. And then on top of that long escrow, this person asks for uh, like a weekend extension. So we're getting ready to, to, it's moving day. We're supposed to move in on a Saturday. And like on that Thursday, this person says, hey, can we get an extension? So they ask for like a four-day extension. And so now we're moving in on a Tuesday, instead of a Saturday. How many know that not very many people are around to help you move furniture on a Tuesday? Okay. So uh, I, was at, I was going to school. There's not very many, by the way. Let me tell you. Um, <clears throat> I was going to school at Delta, and I had a test on Tuesday because it's not a Saturday. And I decided that I was going to miss my test that day. It was kind of an important test because I wanted to have the whole house cleaned before we moved furniture in. Anybody bought a house before that's been used? You don't want to move into it before you clean it. Okay, so I had lined up this whole crew of people to help me clean the house. <clears throat> and I get there like, dawn. I'm super excited. We have the keys to the house. It's our first house we ever owned. We finally get in there because it's been a forever long escrow. And I show up to the house, and our, the key that they gave us doesn't work. Okay, so I own this home, and I cannot get into it. So I call my realtor, and I'm like, hey, this key you gave us is no good. What is the deal here? So she calls the other person's realtor and come to find out, ahem, we had a key, but we needed five more keys to get in the house. Because this person, let me tell you, they, we had the security screen door and that has a deadbolt on it. And then there was the, the, front, the back door that had a deadbolt and the, the door lock. Three different keys. Okay. And then there's the front of the house. Same thing, security door and then door. Three keys. We had the key that opened the knobby on the inside. So I needed so many more keys where I can get, I own the place. I own it and I can't get into it. Okay. So while I'm waiting for these other five keys to be delivered to me, 
I did, and I've got a whole cleaning crew lined up. I'm, you know, it's a Tuesday, and I'm missing my test at school, and I can't clean my house. I look into the window just to kill time. <clears throat> furniture. Like, furniture, you still live there, furniture. The TV, the entertainment center, the couches, furniture. And I'm thinking to myself, when you buy a house and it's moving day, your house should be empty, right? I mean, this is my first go around with buying a house, but I'm pretty sure there shouldn't be any stuff in your brand new house. And so I'm a little bit mad because it's been a 90-day escrow, and this person still is, and they ask for an extension through the weekend because I'm thinking they're in a bad dash to get their stuff out. They are not in no mad dash. It's like they're trying to delay the process, okay? So I'm getting a little, I'm like, okay, maybe it's just a couple of pieces of furniture. Maybe they wanted to leave them for us. They wanted to bless us with old furniture. That's fine, okay? So then I hop over here, and I'm looking, I'm just kind of looking at the property. And we had a really long driveway, and I look over. I don't know how I missed it in the first place. There's a U-Haul truck back there. Not loaded. The U-Haul truck is not loaded, and there's boxes next to the U-Haul truck. This person is still moving their stuff, and I own it. So now I'm thinking to myself, I own your stuff. You left it in my house. This is my house. I own it. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put it all out on the street and put for free. You can come pick this up. If you want it, it's yours. Or I'm taking it. I didn't want to pay $50 for the dump run, but it's not my stuff. So that's what I'm thinking. I'm getting pretty, I'm, I'm pretty mad. <clears throat> so then what happens? Story gets better. <gasps> I decide, well, I'm looking over, and it's a two-story house, and there's, like, you can climb up onto the roof right here if you had a ladder, and the window's open right here. And I'm like, I'm going in, I'm going in my house. I'm going to go in the window. And so I found the ladder that they left me, and I climb up the ladder onto the roof, and I open the door, and I land on the staircase. Awesome. And then I, I was fine. I was fine. I, wa I broke the blinds, though. I was like, that's great. They were ugly anyway. So then I walk up the stairs. The closet is full of clothes. There's a bed with, like, bedding on it. Like, this person didn't move anything. 90-day escrow. That's, like, three months. That's three months, okay? Plus the weekend extension. The house is full. <laughs> so I'm, like, I'm... I'm mad. I missed my test at school. I'm moving in on a Tuesday. It's not a Saturday. This person is trying to ruin my life. I'm having a bad day. <clears throat> and it just so happens that the cleaning people were good Christian folk who helped talk me off the ledge of just being crazy. Anybody being crazy? Need some good Christian people to be like, come back. <laughs> That's what they did. And they said, you know what, Tiff? We're, we'll help move, move this person. And so the nice Christian people that I had surrounded myself with, they boxed up all this person's clothing. They boxed up all this person's belongings. They moved it out of the house and into the U-Haul that was purchased and sitting in the driveway. And then they helped me clean the whole house. And then they helped us paint the house and move the furniture all in one crazy long day. And in the middle of that, this is what Jesus did. Number one, he showed me that Tiffany is crazy selfish. Okay? You are too, probably. <laughs> you just have to have a bad day to figure it out. Okay, this is what happened. I called her realtor. Somehow or another, I, I was able to get his phone number. We were using the same company. And he didn't give away all the information because that's private and, you know, they have a job to do, people job. But he gave me enough information. And Jesus, Jesus did something to me. That realtor told me, you know what, you're right. That is, she left that stuff in your house, and so it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. <clears throat> and I'm really sorry that you didn't have the right key. You should have had the right key. And I'm really sorry that she asked for an extension and you had a really long escrow. Uh, but if I could just be honest with you, uh, she recently lost her husband, and she can't afford the house, which is why she has to get rid of it. And she wasn't prepared to lose her husband, and so she started making some poor life choices. And, and when he said that, it was like Jesus showed me this picture of a, just a drowning woman. You know, this woman, she lost her husband, and she was losing her house. And she didn't, have, she didn't have good friends. She didn't have a good support system. And so all of this life change was happening, and she was in the middle of a really big struggle. And we're buying the house. We're getting to move into it. It's the cheapest house in all Lodi. 
but it's ours, and we're going to move into it. And she's moving out of it, and she doesn't even have to have a place to go. She was boxing up all of her stuff to put it in storage. And have you ever been to a place? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever have you ever been in a place where you felt so alone like you were just swimming in uncertainty and it was like you don't know your next right step when you have a really bad day and you don't know your next right step sometimes you just go into give up mode i just i can't i can't there's too much i don't have a support system i have to do this all on my own and i can't and so I'm, I'm really grateful that that support system of cleaning people were there to help me make better decisions. And so we boxed, we boxed up our stuff and we put it in the truck. <coughs> and we, will able, we were able to bless her. But in the, because I had them helping me, I was able to put my own struggle into perspective. And I know some of us have some really bad struggles. We've got some real, mine's kind of funny because moving into a house full of stuff isn't really, it's not like you got some terrible news from the doctor. It's, it's not comparable at all. But can I tell you that even in our bad days, even in our worst struggle, we are more blessed oftentimes than we think we are. And I just want to say, if you've forgotten how blessed you are, take a trip to the nursing home and ask how many people haven't had a visitor in two weeks. When was the last time you went two weeks without talking to somebody or seeing somebody. So even in the middle of our own struggle, we are more blessed than we often realize. When you find yourself in the middle of a painful problem, it is so easy to lose your perspective. It is so easy to go into the mode of singing that song. Nobody knows my sorrow. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Like you're all alone in your room and you're singing the song to yourself with your pity party just alone. Nobody else on planet Earth has ever experienced what I'm experiencing. I am all alone. Nobody understands this. And I know that feels true, but can I tell you that our feelings lie all the time? Our feelings lie to us all the time. It may feel like that's true, but it's not. Jesus, in the middle of hanging on the cross on his absolute worst day of life, was offering hope to someone else. And can I tell you that in the middle of your worst day of life, life Jesus' day was worse. And he says to you, I'm, I'm here with you. I'm, I'm here with you. I'm going to help you in the middle of that struggle. Um, <clears throat> Isaiah 58, 10 through 11 says this. If you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry... And satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Then your light will rise in the darkness. And your night will become like the noonday. Your bad day will get better. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. And will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden. Like a spring whose waters never fail. When he says he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land, sounds amazing. Picture yourself in a sun-scorched land. If you're in the sun, it's the desert. There is nobody around you for miles and miles and miles and miles, and you are thirsty because there is no water. And he says in the middle of that place, when you feel like you're in the desert, there's no water, there's no hope, there's no one to be found, he says, I will satisfy your needs in that place. And what's incredible is if, if we keep our eyes on Jesus, he says, you will satisfy the needs of others who are in that place. Isn't that good? Our God is so good. So here's a biblical principle. Even though I think you know it, I think it's great to remind ourselves that even though we do have needs, we are going to be faithful to other people first. And there, I was reminded, Jesus reminded me of this lady I used to know. She lived in her van. She didn't have a home. She didn't have very much money. Um, she lived in her van. And you know what? She was always giving things away to people. If she got something, she would give them money. Like if she got money, she said, oh, you need something? Here, I got you. Wow, she didn't have anything. She lived in a van. What do you mean she's giving money away? Even though she had real need, she was keeping her eyes on Jesus, and she was helping the oppressed, and she was helping the hungry. Can I tell you, if you're here today and you live in a home, you are more blessed than you realize. 
Amen. And even though you have trouble and even though you have struggle, you are still blessed and you're still provided for. We know, here's something we know, here at Lifeline, in order to help you, we've got to get you to help others. Our whole programming is built around this principle, the growth track. We talk about the growth track all the time. The growth track isn't so that our nursery classrooms are fully staffed. The growth track is because you need to serve people. <laughs> when you're serving people, when you're helping other people, when you're in relationship with other people, your needs get met. Your perspective gets corrected. You get to see the solution, and, and your, the, the immediacy of your needs begins to fall off. And so we believe in the growth track, not because we need you, but because we want to help you. We want to serve you. We want to care for you. And we know that if you're serving other people, then, then you're, you're going to be served. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 through 7 says this. <clears throat> all praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus, the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person just as God was there for us. We have plenty of hard times that come from following the Messiah, but no more so than the good times of his healing comfort. You're going to go through bad days, but you're also going to have some really good ones. We get a full measure of that too. When we suffer for Jesus, it works out for your healing and salvation. If we are treated well and we're given a helping hand and encouraging word, that also works to your benefit, spurring you on, face forward, unflinching. Your hard times are also our hard times. When we see that you are just as willing to endure the hard times as to enjoy the good times, we know you're going to make it, no doubt about it. So here's the process. He is going to bring you in the middle of your struggle alongside someone else. You know what? It's because God did that with Jesus on the cross. In the middle of Jesus, okay, I mean, if you're a loving father and your son is suffering, you're not going to make him work, right? Right? If you're a loving God, I mean, think about yourself as a parent. If you're, if you're a baby boy, you got a baby boy, and he's suffering, you're going to, like, run up to him, and you're going to put your arms around him, and you're going to love him, and you're going to squeeze him. You're not going to say, hey, help this person. But that's what God did. In the middle of Jesus' worst day, God provided two other strugglers. And this guy, the, the one struggler reached out and said, remember me when you come. God put Jesus to work on his worst day ever and said, keep your eyes on the people that we're bringing into my kingdom. Amen. God wants to do the same thing with you guys. And he's going to equip you to do it. He has equipped you to do it. God uses you through your, through your gifts and your passions. Uh, this is things like, if you, it's your gift and your passion. When you do it, you're like, this is it. Some people are made to be teachers or some people, I'm not hospitable at all. You come to my house, I will forget to offer you water. I probably won't offer you any food. You're not going to feel super welcome just because that's not my gift. I love you, but you're not going to feel that because I'm just not good at it. I know that. I know that. Some people are really hospitable, and when they do that, they're like, this is it. I love my life. Some people like serving. You know, they really just can't wait to clean a toilet. And when they're cleaning the toilet, they're like, praise God, someone's going to sit here and get saved. You know what I mean? Like, that's just when you're doing your passion, it feels good. But here's the other thing. We often disqualify ourselves based on our past and based off of our mess-ups. And Jesus will use your mess-ups. Do not disqualify yourself based on your past. Here's the thing. Someone who just got clean would rather talk to someone who's been clean and walking through that life than me. I cannot relate to that person's struggle, but someone who's, who's been in an addiction and has gotten clean and has gotten some freedom and has gotten some space from that, absolutely they want that person. Someone who's parenting a toddler doesn't want to talk to someone who ain't never had kids. They, I, you, can't, you don't know my struggle. You can tell me all the good things you want, but you don't know. You've never been there. But in the middle of my struggle, when I can talk to another parent who says, yeah, I just broke down crying yesterday because my kid wouldn't listen to me either, you're like, oh, man, this is normal. There's some hope there. Your hard time is my hard time. And if you can make it, then we're going to celebrate on the other end together. Do not disqualify your past. Do not disqualify your current position. Do not disqualify your recent mess up. Because 
you can speak to someone. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> and I did it wrong. Let me tell you what you shouldn't do. Or I made it, and let me tell you what you should do. <clears throat> we, have a, we have a value here. We are transparent and unashamed. It is our strength that people look up to, but it is our weakness that people relate to. And so we will live unmasked, never afraid to be ourselves, because we all got struggle. We all got struggle, and someone's going to relate to our struggle, and they're going to find freedom, and they're going to find healing, and they're going to find Jesus in your vulnerability. Amen? Okay. God can take your most painful times and use those to bless someone else. So let's look at how to help others. Number one, offer them stability. Luke 23, 43, this is the statement that Jesus is making, the first part of it. Jesus says, assuredly, I say to you. Jesus, talking to that struggler, says, assuredly, I say to you. Jesus says, I see you, I acknowledge you, I hear you, and I'm talking right at you, and I'm giving you a promise. Most certainly, you can be certain. People need something solid because everything in our lives is constantly shifting and changing. We can feel the instability and the uncertainty in our life. Money is fleeting. Jobs are fleeting. The econ all of this stuff that, that feels like it should provide security is fleeting. It's all uncertain. And Psalm 42 says, He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. And so if Jesus has done that for you, this is the cool thing. You can look at your fellow struggler and say, I don't know the exact answer to your problem. But you know what I do know? I read this book, and it was super helpful. You know, you can say, I don't know the exact answer to your problem, but I can bring you to a church, Lifeline Church, where they're going to love you, they're going to accept you, they're not going to judge you, and then they're going to help you discover who God created you to be. I'd love for you to come with me. You can offer them, you can offer them Jesus. I don't know the exact answer to your problem, but you know what? I know my God does. I know my God does because he helped me in the middle of my struggle, and I know he can help you in the middle of your struggle. You can offer them certainty. God is certain. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never change. If he helped you, he can help them. Believe that. Number two, offer them support. The second, the middle of the sentence, Jesus says, today you will be with me. Jesus said, not only am I going to encourage you, not only am I going to see you and acknowledge you, I'm going with you. We are in this together. I'm not just going to point the way. I'm going to walk through it with you. I'm going to take the journey with you. You guys ever had anybody here at Lifeline ask you where the men's bathroom is? It's outside. It's outside. So if you're a man and you're looking for the bathroom, it's hard to find. <laughs> And so I've had people ask me, hey, you know where the, where the restroom is? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, out three doors and around seven corners and then go through the rain and you'll find the bathroom. No, no, no. If you're a lifeline and someone asks you where the men's restroom is, you walk them there so they can find it. This is funny, but Jesus is going with you. He's not just going to point the way. He is walking with you. He's going to grab you by the hand and he's going to show you how to get to where you're going. Uh, and I want to say this. Maybe you're not physically alone. We're talking about offering someone support. You're not physically alone, but in your heart you feel alone. When hard times come, when bad days come, it almost feels like, uh, maybe it feels like your wife is against you or your husband against you. The person who should love you the most, you've got some made up, I'm going to say it's made up because it's, well, whatever. Uh, this idea that you are all alone. Nobody is for you. Everybody's against you. And so when you face a bad day, even though you're surrounded by loved ones, it really feels like you're all alone. And I want to tell you that, that that's what our life groups are for. Maybe no one in your circle right now can understand exactly how you feel, but maybe you'll go to a life group and you're going to be able to connect with another person who has experienced some of that similar struggle. And, you know, we've got financial groups and we've got anxiety groups, and you're like, man, that doesn't really speak to me. Uh, go to the life group anyway because the curriculum, the curriculum really isn't the point. It's the relationship. So you go to a financial group and you don't get nothing financial, but you find someone who understands your depression. And they're one step ahead of you. And so they can lead you out. They can help point the way. You can go through those hard times together, and then you can celebrate victories together. Amen? That's the point. That's, that's what those life groups are for. If you get around godly people, you will discover, this is fun, God will make sure you don't all have a bad day at the same time. <laughs> So one of you will have a bad day, and two people are like, yeah, yeah, I know you got this. I'll be there. What can I do for you? And then you get out of your struggle, and then the next day, someone else has a bad day. But you know what's great? 
Now you can help them. Ecclesiastes 4, 12. A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So I don't care if you need financial help. Go to FPU because you're going to find some friends. Amen? Three, offer them salvation. The third thing we can do is offer them salvation. The last part of the sentence, the statement that Jesus makes is in paradise. Salvation. God can rescue you from your situation, and he can rescue them from theirs. Here, here's, here's, here's what Jesus did. He looked at that man and said, I know you're going through it, but heaven is coming. I mean, get this. Jesus didn't take that man off the cross. Jesus didn't get up off of his cross and take that other man off of his cross. Jesus didn't remove that man from his struggle. What he did was give him hope in the middle of it. And that hope was enough strength to just keep going. And that's what Jesus does. Oftentimes, Jesus, you know, fixes our struggle and, you know, he points us to the solution and, and he does what we're asking him to do. And other times, he just redirects our eyes to hope, to the future to where he's taken us. John 14, 12, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And that's where we're headed. We're headed to be with Jesus, who's at the right hand of the Father. Jesus directs us towards the fact that this is not our home. There is a better place. So your last two blanks. Jesus offers more than a better now. He offers a better place. And so sometimes we don't have the answer to a person's struggle. We don't have the answer to our own struggle, but Jesus in the middle of that says, this isn't your home, son. This isn't your home, daughter. I know this life is hard, and I know this situation is icky, and I know know the person you're helping, this is icky, but this isn't it. Keep your eyes on the future. Keep your eyes fixed on me and study how I did it. So let's go ahead and pray. You guys want to close your eyes and bow your heads. Not because that's spiritual, but it helps us to eliminate distraction and just be able to glory. So, Father, I thank you for who you are. And I thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord, I thank you that in the middle of Jesus' worst day, you put him to work. Because you help it. It's like it, it helps to normalize our struggle. We all have struggle. We all go through, through, through things, but we're never alone. There is always someone next to us, and you are always with us. And this morning when I was praying, I remember I was, uh, you just reminded me, and I, I feel like that's what you're saying to your people this morning, and so this is, this is for your people, that when you looked out into the crowd, you saw, it says that, that you had compassion for the crowds of people. Because when you looked out, you said you saw a bunch of sheep without a shepherd. You saw a bunch of lost people. They were looking for hope. They were looking for direction. They were looking for comfort. They were looking for peace. And they didn't know where to go to find it. And so they were just bumping into each other and bang and just lost. And, and so often we find ourselves there. And, you, and your word says that you had compassion on them. And then you began to teach them. And you began to heal their diseases. You began to meet their needs. And if you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, then even though we can't see you, you're there doing that in the middle of our life. You're being our shepherd. You're guiding us. You're hurting us. You're helping us to work together. You're meeting our needs. And so I give you praise and I give you glory for that, that you are there. You're an ever-present help in time of trouble. And you don't just get us through our own struggle. But you, you're so good. You're so good that you bring someone else next to us. So number one, we can realize we're not alone. And number two, you give us the strength to offer encouragement and hope because it builds up our faith. I thank you, God. You're so good. You're so good. I pray that you would minister to your people. Lord, in the middle of their struggle, Father, would you open their eyes so that they would see a fellow struggler that they can help, that they can connect to where they can share those bad days and they can share those good days. In the name of Jesus, would you bring relationship? Would you bring comfort? 
Would you bring freedom from depression and anxiety and fear and this idea that they're alone? Father, would you bring connection and relationship to your church, to your people? With every head bowed and every eyes, all your eyes closed, if you've never given your life to Jesus and you want to say today, it's like you're looking at Jesus and you're saying, remember me. You have that same cry of the person on the cross. You want to be seen. You want to be noticed. If he really is the son of God, then you want the son of God to see you. Then I want to talk to you today. I'd love to just introduce you to Jesus to help make that connection. And if you're in the room and you walked away from Jesus and so it doesn't, you know, you knew him at one point, but you feel far away like, does Jesus remember me? That's how far away you feel. But I want to talk to you today as well. I, I want to give you the opportunity to, to pray, and I'd love to pray with you, and I'm going to do that. But on the count of three, I want you to raise your hand. Nobody's looking around. You just raise your hand. It's between you and Jesus. Jesus is seeing you. He's saying, I see you. Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so if that's you, on the count of three, would you just raise your hand? One, two, three. Three, if that's you, raise your hand. I see your hands. Praise Jesus. I see your hands. More importantly, Jesus sees your hands, and he says, I see you. So church, would you just pray with me? Father God, I thank you for your son. I thank you for your salvation. I thank you that I'm not alone in my struggle. Would you forgive my sin? Would you expose my doubt? And would you fill me with your spirit and help me to keep my eyes fixed on you. I praise you, Jesus. 